You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 151. Human sacrifices, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Bill Murray, Dr. Peter Venkman, Ghostbusters. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Hey guys, before we get started, I want to let you know that we are having our annual Black Friday sale at Indie Film Hustle Academy and Indie Film Hustle TV. If you are interested in learning more about screenwriting and filmmaking, film distribution, learning screenwriting and character development from uh, instructors like James V. Hart, the writer of Hook and Dracula, learning film distribution from me with my course, The Film Distribution Blueprint, learning how to produce an independent film from veteran producer Suzanne Lyons, how to pitch investors, the indie film funding formula, and so much more. So head over to ifhacademy.com and use the coupon code BLACKFRIDAY2021. And you can also go to IndieFilmHustle.tv and use the same coupon code BLACKFRIDAY2021 to get 30% off the annual subscription. Now this sale is only going to be going on until November 30th, so act quickly. Again, IFHacademy.com and IndieFilmHustle.tv, coupon code Black Friday 2021 for 30% off everything. Welcome, guys, to a ghost-busting episode of the Indie Film Hustle podcast. We have on the show today the co-writer of the new Ghostbusters movie, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Gil Kanan. And Gil uh, co-wrote it with Jason Reitman, and I've had a chance to watch Ghostbusters, and uh, I got to tell you, all I can tell you is no spoilers, and this episode, by the way, will have no spoilers, so you can listen to it without any 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 worries. But all I can tell you is it is the sequel that Ghostbusters deserves. That's all I'm going to say about the film. But Gil and I not only get into the making of Ghostbusters, how he and, and Jason got together to write the script and all that, but also we go down the road of his career as a writer-director and what he's done with films like City of Amber – Poltergeist, and his new film for Netflix, A Boy Called Christmas. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Gil Kanan. I'd like to welcome the show, Gil Kanan. How you doing, Gil? Doing great. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, man. I, uh, I am, I'm a fan of your work. I've, from Monster House to City of Ember uh, and your latest collaboration with Mr. Reitman, both Mr. Reitman's, uh, <laughs> Ghostbusters Afterlife, which we will definitely be getting into uh, later in the conversation. But first, how did you get started in the business? Well, I, I had one of those experiences that you uh, you think about sometimes when you're going to film school um, as a sort of scenario that might happen but that you accept at some point during school isn't going to happen to you <laughs> uh, which is that i made a short film that was uh screened uh at the dga and out of that screening i got representation uh and that the representation ended up being 
pretty serious. So I, I got signed to CAA while I was sort of graduating from UCLA film school. And the weird thing is that I, I had made a short film, this short called The Lark, that by any measure should not have had a commercial breakthrough potential. It's a <laughs> weird 10 minute black and white um, live action animation hybrid about an abusive relationship uh, with a with a bird. Um, so so uh, money, just money, just you could smell the money. You could smell it. It just it, nothing <laughs> says box office like a clay animated uh, tiny bird that uh, that comes to life and murders an abusive husband. It just says it says <laughs> give this kid a shot. And so so uh, that film screened at the DGA as part of the UCLA Spotlight Awards. And there was an assistant uh, on the desk of a film lit agent at CAA who was there covering the event. He came afterwards and gave me his card. And uh, he then took a DVD. He might have gone with a hybrid strategy of DVD and VHS because this was in the, uh, yeah. you know, the final days of VHS uh, short distribution. And he brought it into the agency and made a bunch of copies, was very intrepid with it, sent it to everyone. And by the following Wednesday, I was represented by um, some pretty serious people. And uh, so so that's kind of how um, I got my start as a film director, because they ended up sending the film around to a bunch of people. And one of those people was Robert Zemeckis. Um, who was beginning to think about producing Monster House. And then he and I had a series of meetings that led to me being brought on to, to make that film. But I will say that um, before any of that, I, I grew up in the Valley in the, in, in Reseda, uh, you know, outside of the, the, the center of filmmaking, which is sort of Burbank and Hollywood, but still, sort of tangentially connected to it. Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting through a summer internship program called Inner City Filmmakers, um, a series of internships from the time that I was 17, just right after I graduated high school uh, in various, uh, various departments on film, mostly editorial. And so my very first paying job uh, where I had to actually report to work was as a editorial intern on the Tony Scott film Crimson Tide. Oh. And oh. and uh and so that was a pretty crazy initiation to the world of <laughs> film filmmaking. Uh and then ended up working on films throughout my uh university and uh and film school careers. Well, I got to ask you, what is it like watching Tony Scott work? Did you get to see him like a director or being on set a little bit? So um that was actually a pretty weird experience because it was a very caustic environment, the editing room. It was actually mm. pretty harsh. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I ended up being basically a human mule carrying prints <laughs> from the Disney lab to the Culver Studios where the, uh, the temporary editing rooms were set up. Um, but I, um, I remember feeling the seriousness of it that everyone was like taking the task of telling the story extremely seriously. Like there was a lot of sort of octane and machismo in the air. No, uh, I, can't, I can't, I don't understand why. Yeah. I have no understanding uh, why. <laughs> and there was like cigar, literal cigar Cigars. thing going on. There may yeah. have been some cowboy hats. It was, <laughs> it was a hardcore environment, but, um, but it was a, but it was a, it definitely felt like a threshold. Anyway, I got hooked. From that moment on uh, to the allure of storytelling uh, on a grand scale, you know, uh, a couple hundred friends coming together to tell a story um, and uh, have it, it, it sort of never, never Left waned. You. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, it's what I like to call the sweet disease. Uh, once you get bit by the drug uh, or by the, by the bug, you can't, can't get rid of it. You're done. You're done. It's, it's for life. You can't get rid of it. As much as you might want to sometimes in, in your journeys, you're unfortunately stuck with it. Um, now, I, I also got to ask you, 
you know, because not many of us are going to have the opportunity of having a meeting, especially that first meeting with Robert Zemeckis out of out of college. Dude, what is that like walking into that room and just sitting down and you're like, hey, Bob. <laughs> um, it's it's pretty intense. I mean, um, so it's there's two ways to answer it. The 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 film fan in me is freaking out, obviously. Right. Sure. Because filmmakers, film directors to people like us who grow up eating, drinking, sleeping film. It's, it's the storyteller that is the real star of every film. You know, the actors are cool, but the, 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 the people who are making the film are the ones that I actually had. You know, if, if I could have had trading cards, it would have been Robert Zemeckis, Steven Spielberg, <laughs> Coppola, <Richard> Donner. <laughs> yeah. And so, so uh, that part of me is freaking out and doing backflips and like terrified and shaking. But it's it's sort of offset by another part of me that I discovered actually in that meeting or in the hours leading up to that meeting, which is the part of me that had a story to tell and became so passionate about making sure that I was the person who told that story that somehow I am able to suppress the terror <laughs> of meeting a God uh, and actually look, look him in the eye and say, I know how this story should be told, or I have some ideas for this story and, uh, and being taken seriously, uh, maybe not totally seriously in the first meeting, but progressively with more, with more <laughs> seriousness. And, um, and I actually kind of found that out about myself at that point. And I have had that experience a few times since where I'm like, I should be objectively like, freaking out i should be vomiting in a trash can in the hallway right now <laughs> right but I, I but i feel a responsibility to the story that i i don't want to let the story down and i feel right. like i have if i if i'm not the voice for this story right now i don't know who else is going to do it and they might That's not awesome. care as much as i do so anyway it's it's a little earnest but it's the it's the damn truth yeah and it's also just like yeah because i imagine you still have to act as a professional because you want to get the job but at the same time the, the, the you know the, the 10 year old inside of you you're like oh my god back to the future oh my god back to <laughs> oh, oh my god roger rabbit oh my god like you're just freaking out so i can only imagine I, that there's that yeah <laughs> i may have mentioned uh in one of those first meetings that uh, i did create a linear <laughs> graphed out version of the um of the space-time continuum across the three back to the future films of course to try you did. to find to try to find holes in the in, in the narrative structure as a kid and um uh so what did know, he that, say that, that, what did he say what did he say to that <laughs> i think he's probably heard every version of, of that movie changed my life um because for so many of us, it was a gateway moment where sure, so sure. many so many engines were firing in unison at the same time with those films that it just felt like we were uh, we're the Back to the Future generation. Yeah, exactly. There, and it's it's I had to, I showed Back to the Future to my wife a few years ago, and she just I just hadn't seen it in forever, and I was just sitting there smiling the entire time, and she's like, "You really like these movies?" I go, "Yeah, I do." These are probably one of the best trilogies of all time like it is it's perfection and god and god help anybody who wants to remake it i'm just throwing that out there into the universe god help anyone who tries to remake that because you can't <laughs> i don't know. i mean the weird thing is like what would it be? It'd be it would take place in the in the 90s at this point it just like it, it, it you so couldn't harsh. you it's kind of like the remake of point break really <laughs> like you can't capture that magic again <laughs> more 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 power to them let's see let's see what they do but yeah I'm not, i don't i don't i don't need to see that maybe uh, I, i've got a, i've got a perfect uh there's a perfect place on my mantle for uh, the films that that bob made yes see? absolutely no question so casual <laughs> bob hey bob so you know you worked with not only bob but you also worked with uh, steven spielberg on monster house what was the I biggest what was uh... <laughs> my, my professional lighting setup is uh, crumbling. <laughs> I'm sure everyone at home is imagining <laughs> a, 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 an ace Hollywood setup with a full crew behind my laptop. But 
In fact, it's a desk lamp that is held up by a glass full of acorns. I'm not kidding. Um, why this acorns? Is, this I have is, no idea. This is uh, this is the reality. I, I always we always like to dismiss the the myths of Hollywood, and and they think that every yeah that like you run around with a crew walking behind you at all times. Let me let me get the gaffer to adjust the mug full of acorns real quick, just so I can. <laughs> properly be illuminated jesus i have a, I, I, I have a squirrel behind the laptop <laughs> making minor adjustments right now so uh so you worked with bob but you also worked with steven spielberg on monster house what was the biggest lesson you took away from working with those two legends well i it's hard to even figure out how to approach the the subject of that because there were a few things. One, I, I was uh, immediately struck by my tremendous luck at being a person oh, who yeah. was able to be in that environment because nothing in my life up until that point suggested that that was possible. So <laughs> luck definitely had something to do with it. Um, I had an extraordinary experience on Monster House where the very first time that I met uh, – Steven, it was with Bob and we were showing the work that I had been doing for a couple of months to start to create the look and sort of design of the film that I would be making uh, or hoped to be making. And then we went into the next room, which was the Amblin screening room and projected the animatic that I had put together with a very crack, small team of artists and sitting down was probably one of the scariest moments of my life. Like as the lights dimmed and the animatic started, oh. I was like, okay, I guess I'm putting this out there in front of these two literal gods of storytelling. But when the lights came up, a conversation started and within a few sentences, I realized that we weren't talking anymore about whether or not I would I would be making the film. We were starting to talk about the, the content of it, like mm -hmm. the, the, the pacing and tone and a couple of specific plot points and 45 minutes passed. And it was just the three of us having this conversation. I remember just thinking in the back of my head, like I'm trying to stay cool and engage, <laughs> but I'm also thinking, Holy shit. Like this is actually happening. I'm having a story conversation with these two, you know, Legends. wizards of yeah. film. Um, and, and I, I, so I learned an incredible amount of stuff. I mean, one of the things that I, that I've taken from that very first conversation was because we were talking about structure and pacing, uh, and specifically first act. And there's always a tendency, first acts are really easy to write. And then you get to go put a film together and you start to pull away because you're like, okay, you want the audience to be able to get into the, into, into the real nuts and bolts of the story. And I remember coming out of that conversation, both of them impressed on me that, that tendency, the instinct to cut into the first act is one that you have to suppress as a director, that you should actually fight to keep those, moments that feel like they are too long feel like they they don't have any place in in a film because if an audience ends up loving your film at the end it's because of the investment that they put into character in the first act and so that that's felt great. like okay that's an actual lesson you know i i i, I took wow. it um and i i never i never let go wow man that's that's actually a really great piece of advice that's a really great reason I, of advice I'm happy to happy to pay it forward. <laughs> now, uh, another film you did, which I was a big fan of when it came out, when I watched *The City of Ember*. Um, oh, you're the fan. I'm it's the one. I'm the one. I, it was a pleasure. Uh, no, I actually, I actually really enjoyed it when it came out, and I saw it, and I was like, "This is really ingenious and it's so funny." You're the dude. Hey. Uh, <laughs> But how I did you? I'd meet, I knew I'd meet I, him eventually. I knew I'd meet him eventually. Okay, but all, all joking aside, how did you come up with? How did you come up with uh, the the concept of it and 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 go down that road? And how did you get that made? <laughs> That's another question. Yeah, it it definitely was a moment in time. I mean, I started developing City of Ember actually at the same time that I was beginning to have my meetings on monster house so 
uh, City of Ember was adapted on uh, on a novel, a series of novels by Jean Dupree, who um, and those books were sent to me by Playtone, Tom Hanks's production company. Yeah. Uh, again, as part of that initial round of, of sure, media. why not? <laughs> We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Very casual moment in my life. Totally <laughs> normal, totally normal, easy. completely normal. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I ended up developing that and was lucky enough to bring on a screenwriter who I really loved, Caroline Thompson, who had written Edward Scissorhands and oh. countless other. Yeah. incredible screenplays and she and i began a collaboration that was going on throughout post on monster house so i was lucky enough to have a script that i could say this is what i want to make next before monster house was even out and i think the the answer to the question of like how it got made was probably the sort of the excitement that was starting to happen around the release of monster house. And then what sealed the deal was when monster house got nominated for an Oscar, right? Uh, basically city of Ember got greenlit. It was a weird moment though, because it was like being made by a sort of experimental studio. It was a partnership between Fox and Walden that actually yeah. that didn't survive the release of the film. So they were, um, they went out of business or broke apart as a studio before we came out. Um, and that wasn't great for the film or for <laughs> me. It was a bit of a nightmare because I ended up not dealing with executives by the end. I was dealing with lawyers who were. That's managing. always fun. It's yeah. great. It's yeah. why you go into the business. You know, you <laughs> want to tell stories. And you want to talk to lawyers about assets. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, it just felt like pure creativity. Um, but so that it was like. It was an incredible experience. I had the best cast. I, I met Toby Jones, who I continue to work with. Bill Murray, who obviously I've now uh, been lucky enough to have worked with in some capacity twice. Um, Sir Sharonin, um, uh, Tim Robbins. Tim yeah. Robin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really a, an incredible group of actors and artists. Uh, so it was a wonderful experience that was tinged with a lot of complexity. And what came out, I'm proud of, but could have been so much more. Uh, and so it's it was a big lesson. And for those of you who are listening, who are thinking, screw this guy and his uh, easy path to getting a directing <laughs> career from film school, this is the moment in the conversation where you sit back and uh, smile and, uh, <laughs> and enjoy some schoidenfreude that uh, i had a i had a really hard time on the on the second film well there's there's that and, and that's the thing that um look man i I've, I've talked to hundreds if not thousands of filmmakers now over the course of what i do and and i've heard every story and there's never one that's the same i you're like oh i just happened to run into spielberg at a coffee shop and he greenlit my movie like and you, you hear the weirdest stories and i've heard the easy ones i've heard the hard ones i've heard the ones that are completely lucky I've heard the ones that have taken 20 years. It's all relative, but I don't care who you are. You always have, there's always those pits and fall, you know, the valleys. And, yeah, yeah. And there's always that. There's always that. So regardless of how you get in, man, hey, God, more, I, for me, it's like more power to you, man. If you got in, that's just, hopefully that gives us a chance, somebody else a chance at one point or another to get that opportunity. But it was timing though. And that's the thing I always tell people because they always, a lot of people look back to the 90s, especially during the Sundance independent phase with Robert and and Rick Linkletter and Burns and Smith and all these kind of guys. And they're like, oh, I'm going to do what they did. I'm like, you can't. Like, that's that was a moment in time yeah. that was very specific. So you happened to get Monsters, Monster, which is against all odds, Monster House, Monster House off. Yeah. Then it happened to get nominated. And you also had City of Amber waiting in the wing. So you didn't like start it after you got nominated. So it all, the timing was perfect. And of course, the way Hollywood works is like, oh, you just got nominated. What do you want to do next? And that's your, that's your golden, that's your Willy Wonka ticket. Yeah, and then exactly. So, so, it, so it sort of was a, uh, it was a really good set of timings and circumstances. And 
it was a crazy experience. You know, I'd gone from making an animated film to now having right. an entire city built in Northern well, Ireland and Belfast. Well, I have to ask you, because, I mean, I remember the, the sets were stunning. And it wasn't, mm-hmm. it wasn't, I mean, it was 2007, 2008, if I'm not right. mistaken. Yeah. yeah, 2008. 2008 yeah. was a release. 2007 yeah. we filmed. So you filmed the 2007. So, yeah, there's visual effects. And, yeah, there's still, you know, but... It's not where we are now as far as like world building. Like a lot of the stuff, if you would reshoot that movie today, would probably be done digitally. Uh, oh, yeah, but wait, wait till you see uh, A Boy Called Christmas. I can't I mean, wait actually, to see that. Actually, we um, – You built – oh, wait, that was all built? I, I, I built so much of that city. So I had a, an incredible production designer, Gary Williamson, on A Boy Called Christmas. And uh-huh. I learned a lesson on City of Ember that uh, when you can swing it, Building Build the world makes an incredible yeah. difference both for the audience but more importantly for the actors and the cameras uh, when you're shooting because you just have that sense of place that's very difficult to fake when everything's green screened and caught right. in. Right. And I, I still fight for as much build as possible. I, for me, that's a priority in filmmaking. So I, I put real em- emphasis uh, on in the budgeting phase towards getting as much tangibly uh built Agreed. practical on stuff and then so when you walked on the city of amber uh like as a filmmaker man what is that like playing in such a beautiful pay- playground i mean you've got bill murray you've got tim robbins you got this insanity yeah. of a set what is that like you know how did you feel being on set like day one and also and again this is not an animated movie anymore now you're on a live action yeah playing with with serious hitters serious serious yeah. punchers <laughs> um there was a lot of stress about getting what i needed on on camera in that film because the the amount of visual material was so overwhelming oh, yeah. and i had to stay very disciplined about what i was shooting so that i could make sure that i was emphasizing performance and storytelling and not getting lost in the sort of beauty of the environment because right. I was my eyes were bugging out every direction I looked because it was so cool. And I think that a part of me clicks into place, which is like focus on character, focus on story. That's what ultimately is going to communicate to an audience. Um, but it was so fun to shoot in. And the camera, <laughs> I can imagine. It was designed to be filmed. So, you know, we were just able to move the camera yeah, through sure. it in such, a, in such a cool, dynamic way. And I love moving the camera. And it was like a real joy to be able to have all those practical lights creating material for the eye. And we shot on film, too, which is another thing that I really fought for on that one. It was like one of the last... 35 millimeter films before the full conversion to digital. Obviously now there are films that fight for shooting on film again, but it really was one of the, one of the last in that series of the pure 35 millimeter from the ground up show. Yeah. Yeah. No question. And in 2007, I mean, red had just basically come out and it, it wasn't, yeah. you weren't, it, it wasn't there just yet. Digital. I mean, there no, was no. some collateral collateral. I yeah. Think, had already been out. And so we sort of knew what, where the Viper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah exactly. But it was still like, you had to work with that giant monster of a freaking rig. And it was just like, it was, it was like shooting on, on uh, attack of the clones or something like that. It's like, it's the beginning of, it's like the olden days of 35. You saw those giant blimps that they used to work on. Yeah. It's, just, it's equivalent to the exact same thing. Now, as, as film directors, we, all, we always have a day on set where we feel that the entire world is going to come crashing around us. Everything is, is, is going wrong. Bad performance. Actors not working. We're losing the sunlight. The first AD is killing you because you're not making your day. Something happens in that moment, in that day. What was that day for you on City of Ember and how did you overcome it? Oh my God, this is so long ago. Um, or or uh, any movie, by the way, any movie on Poltergeist yeah, on it's a, anything. It's a it's a it's a it's a really good question. I, I mean, um, there was there was one injury that really frightened me on um, on City of Ember, but it wasn't you know it didn't end up being something that was catastrophic. But the mm-hmm. the Steadicam operator had a slip during a very complex tracking shot, and that was really 
difficult moment as a as a director sure because i felt so responsible you know i had designed a complicated shot that i you know the, the look required a spray down a hose down of the streets of course it did treacherous conditions so that was really difficult um w- one thing on ember that i i remember that was just like a reality of filming in Northern Ireland and I just didn't know how to expect it. We only had one day scheduled of exterior shooting, which those of you who have seen that film can understand why, but the entirety of the film was in a soundstage uh, in, in this city city set, which ended up being uh, Game of Thrones, by the way. The whole, the, 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 I think the, the entirety of Game of Thrones, uh, all the interiors were all shot in the footprint of the city of Ember set. Um, uh, which is, uh, which is always funny for me to think about. Like, I, I know, I know just how cold that crew was <laughs> on that day, but, but, um, but so it ended up raining every single day that we shot on city of Ember. There was not one day without rain. It was like just a crazy summer with no break in, in weather. And then we kept trying to get this one day of the exterior and having to, having to miss it. It's not that dramatic or interesting except for the fact that there was just one shot at it and to do it we had to take the entire crew including Sersha and um and harry treadaway up to a mountain to film and we finally got the one break and just squeaked it out because we were supposed to wrap and and finish the shooting um I, in a, in a pinch, that's the closest I can remember to like a real, a real practical challenge. Um, I, the, the harder ones were all what came later on, you know, like sure. uh, the, the, the studio getting, yeah. getting, and, and that's a much more complex nuanced conversation. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I guess suffice it to say, I'm, I'm proud of the finished film and yeah, uh, especially because of the performances of it. Um, and, uh, and Sersha's second performance and she's already a superstar in it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, um, I'm, I'm psyched that you're a fan. I am. I, I I am. I am definitely a fan of it, man. I'm glad. uh, And I'm just glad movies like that. Can you imagine trying to get that thing they made today? Like it'd be, unless it's a Netflix film. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, streamers would do it. You'll see when, no, when you see a boy called Christmas, you'll see that, uh, Somehow I've been able to squeak out another film that sort of goes uh, against the grain. It has yeah. that more original element to it. It's not based on another film. IP. And yeah, it's right. not that based on IP. And it allowed me to build out a full world that uh, that's the kind of stuff that's really, as you say, super hard to do nowadays. It's, and it, so I'm yeah. extraordinarily proud of the the world building and the in a, in a boy called Christmas. Um, now you also tackled another film called Poltergeist, which how mm-hmm. in God's green earth do you approach a classic like remaking yeah. a, a remaking a classic and then that and you know Stephen, so Stephen was obviously heavily involved with the making of Poltergeist. Uh, it was, you know, Toby Hopper directed it, but Steven was there as well. You know, you see him all, you see the behind the scenes of him, like, you know, pointing and nobody will ever know what actually happened behind the scenes of like what happened there. But regardless, the movie is a classic. How, how do you as a filmmaker go, all right, I think I can bring this to the new generation. And how do you, how do you approach that? Man? I'm fascinated. Well, there, there's, there's a, there's a few things. First of all, you know, it's, it's definitely about as, difficult of a uh of an attempt to make as you can do because the chances of connecting with an audience when you're entering hallowed ground like that are pretty slim um i'm i'm there's a few ways that that process started they gave me a sense that i should try this one was that i got a call from sam raimi and well, that's it, always a, that's always a good that's always a good sign. I basically should just stop there because <laughs> done uh, done. Sam Raimi calls you done. <laughs> uh, and so that was like <laughs> sort of the beginning and the end of it for me. But also after that, um, I went out and found Toby Hooper, oh, wow. and I uh, I went up to him and introduced myself and said that I'm uh, I'm thinking about going into this world of film that he created and um 
and if he had any advice. Uh, and uh, and he was so gracious, and he was That's just awesome. like, you know, it's it's just a story, <laughs> like, um, and, um, and it's I, just a I, movie, I've man. Gotten, it's all good. <laughs> yeah, I've sort of I've sort of gotten that kind of feeling from folks who have made things that are so meaningful to me as a, especially as a young person, where you talk to them and they're like. Oh yeah, that was a movie. You know, you just uh, you, it was a gig I did. It, it was yeah, a gig yeah, I yeah. did. <laughs> yeah, so you're putting way too much. <laughs> you're putting way too much energy into this. Like, chill out. Just go tell a story. <laughs> and so there was a there was a sort of combination of those uh, of, of those Elements. moments. And uh, you know, I, I remember talking to to Zemeckis about it and him saying just how loose the process was when. Uh, when Poltergeist was being made that, you know, they were him and Bob Gale were in the next room working on the draft that they were trying to get back to the future greenlit while Steven was in pre-production on ET and in production on Poltergeist. And that it was just like a, uh, it was a perfect vehicle for cool gags. Like they, they all approached it like, Oh, try this, you know, have the head melt off or, uh, have the clown uh, have the clown with the arms It'll yeah, be fine. exactly and, and um, so obviously incredible artistry very very difficult to enter into that world and connect to people who to whom that film uh, was so important but um, I had a great time making it so proud of my cast Mm-hmm. Um, oh, great! And, I mean, an amazing uh, cast. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and um, and yeah, and I, I'll end as I began. I got a call from Sam Raimi. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's and that, look, I mean, if, if if Sam Raimi called me up like, "Hey, man, can you redo Evil Dead for me?" I'd be like, "I don't." I mean, you're asking me, so I guess. I guess yes. If that's whatever you say, whatever oh, you say, Sam Raimi. Like exactly. <laughs> now, did you pull any nuggets of wisdom from Sam working with him on that? Oh yeah, he's so cool. First of all, there's no better audience in the world than uh, than Sam Raimi. He watches every single screening of every film, whether he worked on it or not, as if it was a matinee in a movie theater. It, it, you know, it, when he's ten years old, oh. he sits he sits front front and center with a huge grin on his face, soaking up the story. And I got mostly from him the notion that you can work in this career in this industry for as long as he has with as much success as he has and still find the absolute joy in in film viewing as much as film making and uh so that would just like put so much wind in my sails to it's inspiring when you're working with collaborators who are just so passionate about about the craft of storytelling it, it, they, they, you know, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting some of these these folks as well, and, and it's they're just like on a whole other level, like they're the way that they approach the craft is is just at a completely different depth than mm-hmm. than the the civilians <laughs> or or normal oh, yeah. or yeah, oh, it, it, it's yeah. just it's just remarkable to see them approach story and i love that that you said to like yeah it was a story yeah it was a little gig yeah we were just throwing some gags up there see what would work because that's what we do when you're starting out like that's exactly what we do with our friends it just so happens that their friends will happen to be like you know john milius and brian de palma and george lucas (laughs) so it was a they just they just happened to be hanging out with a with a high wattage crowd Um, (laughs) that's great great term (laughs) great term i love that term uh yeah it's 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 pretty awesome now uh so your latest project you worked on um was your second to latest project you have two projects that are coming out pretty close together but we're here to talk about ghostbusters and oh my god i saw it last night it is um there's no spoilers here so you can continue listening everybody there is no spoilers i won't spoil anything all i gotta say is it is the sequel that ghostbusters deserved in my in my humble opinion, that's that's very kind of you to say. I'm so proud of it. I, and I am. And, and for people, I, I for people listening, Ghostbusters for me was one of those films I literally saw probably. Th- I'm not an exaggeration. Here, probably 35 times in the theater. Like it was it was a goal of mine to keep going back every weekend. And every time I got re released because there was re releases back then, I wore out the cassette tape. 
Uh, you know what's crazy is, is oh my uh, God, man. checking to see how long that film played in cinemas or you know, in theaters. theaters. It came out in June of 84 and was still in movie theaters all the way through like fall. I think by by November, it was starting to leave movie theaters. But it's just an incredible concept when you think about it. <laughs> and I think it's I think it stayed number one in forever. September oh, or yeah. October. Oh, yeah. It yeah. was a phenomenon, and I was living in New York. And my Ghostbuster stories is this: my de- my stepfather was a taxi cab driver. So wait, so we're driving around Manhattan, and I was with him in the front seat. And all of a sudden, I drive by the Ghostbuster set when nobody was there. It was just blocked off, and it was like the it was after the after Gozer did all the thing, and the the the. the the ambulance is inside and there's snow because I didn't know it was marshmallow. Snow everywhere. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And then six months later, I go to the theater. I'm like, oh my God, I was on the set of Ghostbusters. It was my first. That is so cool. It was my first true experience of of being even close to to Hollywood, being close to a real movie. That was the first time I ever even understood what a movie set was because for kids listening today, there was no information in the 80s about filmmaking. None. None. No, I, I learned I learned most of what I know about movie making from the Universal Studios tour um, <laughs> when, <Yes! laughs> when, we, when we went as tourists. Like, I think that that's where I learned about the ideas behind what went into making something. Right. Uh, but so... Um, so it's so cool that you got to experience that set probably the morning after they filmed it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you've heard Jason talk about this, but uh, Jason Reitman, my uh, my collaborator, co-writer, and the director of Ghostbusters Afterlife, was on set that day uh, at that, um, you know, on the west side of Central Park. Yeah, where yeah, yeah. you saw the road opened up. And he was actually filmed – with his mom um, and I think his sister uh, as part of the background of the folks of watching the Ghostbusters sure. doing their thing um, and was cut out of the film. Oh. Um, and, uh, uh, but but the, he remembers it's one of his first uh, memories as a as a kid was watching them pouring that marshmallow fluff out of buckets uh, uh, on risers. And feeling like, all right, this is movie making. This, this is, is what I want to do. I want to do this. This is what I want to do. Yeah. So you guys happen to be in the same place in the in the that's, same moment of time, which is really cool. That's actually really fu- it's it's that's funny as hell, man. I, and so Ghostbusters has a, a very special place in my heart uh, for both Ghostbusters one and Ghostbusters two. I just and I was in New York when that hit, so you could only imagine it was it was a phenomenon around the world. But being in New York. Mm-hmm. As a kid, when Ghostbuster hit, it just it just it was everything. It was like there was nothing else. like I don't know whether Indiana Jones had just come out. Maybe like there wasn't it still wasn't yeah. the, as as much stuff as there is today. There's a thousand a million things to watch. It was like Ghostbusters was it, man. And the music, that song, oh, Jesus Christ, it was it's so good. So it was a pretty crazy summer because I think Goonies came out. Yeah, like, no, 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 sorry, sorry. Um, Gremlins later. I, I meant Gremlins. Gremlins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gremlins came out. The other, the other, the the, the other G uh, title, the uh, yeah. film. Uh, Gremlins came out that same summer, and so obviously that was like a life changing summer for those of us who were lucky to go to movies 85. at that time. And for me, it was um, yeah. a pretty crazy experience with it because we moved to America when I was seven in July, almost August of 1984, and Ghostbusters was the first film that I saw in a movie theater when we moved to America. <laughs> And, Jesus. Um, wow, I'd, man. And I, obviously, I'd seen films before that, but I um, I so associated it with, with this country that I was now living in, with what a Hollywood movie was and could be. And just like you, it totally it became culture. It became more than a film. Oh, yeah. It was something. It was something that I, uh, we grew up with. I actually called the five 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 number. Um, trying to get to the Ghostbusters. I, what, did it just? Was it just busy? No, it's just it's, it's a 555 five, five number, so nothing happened. Yeah. I think it was busy or something yeah. like that, but I actually like watched it, a commercial one by. I'm like, I wrote down the number real quick. I'm like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call the Ghostbusters. <laughs> That's so sweet. And, you know, by the way, 
we we all felt that instinct. That's why there are moments in this film, right? So uh, I want to get you saw last night that are about satisfying the got... experience that we had as young people watching Ghostbusters, because that is sort of that was that was our mandate was like how to capture the the awe and the joy and the weirdness and magic of seeing Ghostbusters it, in 1984 in, you know, in today's world. It is, it is a, the Ghostbusters universe is something that I feel that needs to be respected. And you guys definitely did it in a way that the Star Wars universe or the Star Trek universe or any other sci-fi mm -hmm. universe, because it has its own world and it, and that world can be built out beautifully. And I think you guys, I think got the, the thing I loved about the film, man, is that you guys got the tone so perfectly done because you can tell that you were definitely nodding to, to the fanboys in the room, you know, and then you were also helping the kids of the fanboys in the room as well. So how did you as writers balance nostalgia with bringing this concept into the new generation? Well, I think that one of the ways we did it was by being aware of what our own expectations were for a new Ghostbusters film as right. fans. I mean, right. obviously, look, look, Jason and I come at this from similar but extraordinarily different places. So like, both <laughs> of us grew up with a love and a, and a, and a sure. passion and respect for Ghostbusters. But I was a kid watching it in a movie theater in the Valley. It's his dad. Jason was the, <laughs> was the son of a director on the, on the side of the camera. Um, and uh, had, went on the press tour with Ivan when the film was being oh, released, and so Jesus. for uh, for 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 him it was a, an incredibly intimate relationship, and for me it was just like a fanboy one. Right. But both of us both of us um, approached the idea of telling another Ghostbusters story with incredible respect for the the films of the 1980s. And we had a sense uh, of, as fans of what we would want to see. But we also knew that if we just made this a sort of museum tour of the past, it would end up feeling like a pretty stiff uh, and, right. and lifeless spectacle. And it happened that through the work of building the character Phoebe and her family, her brother Trevor, her mom Callie, our friends, uh, podcast and lucky that we got to a place where we realized that actually just as important as our own satisfaction of seeing things that we would want to see in a Ghostbusters film, we have the opportunity to have pure discovery in this film because we have characters who have no fucking clue what a Ghostbuster was. And they've grown up in a world where just like a lot of events from the eighties history, <laughs> yeah, this, this is stuff that, that doesn't really register um, in the lives of many people. And so, and, and there's a specific reason for why um, this particular family, Phoebe's family, uh, has kept sort of blinders to the events of those years. Uh, right. Much more, you know, much more sort of emotional and, uh, and uh, baggage related uh, oh, yeah. rationale. But, um, but the point is that through the character of Phoebe, through her eyes, we were able to discover Ghostbusters for the first time all over again, if you know what I mean. No, and it, that, uh, yeah. yeah, and that that became that became uh, that became our compass. That was our way through. It's so funny because my daughters uh, they say old timey uh, when it comes to uh, <laughs> anything that was pre when they were born. They're like, so when was that like? Like the eighties, sometimes they'll bust out like the thirties. I'm like, how old do you think I am? Like, like, you know, when Titanic came, like, were you around when Titanic sank? I'm like, no, I'm not around with what, how old do you think I am? Um, but were you freaked out when that train came at you in the movie theater. I was, and it felt like it was I jumped, right I jumped right on my horse and buggy and I just bolted out of that theater. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> But it was it's 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 fascinating because I love the way that you bring back the eighties in a way uh, it, bring back those events in a way that this generation understands uh, you know with the way they view things and things like that so it was just it was just it was it was masterfully done and I and I applaud both you and Jason to do it when I heard about it I was like okay if there's anybody 
that can do this is Jason as a director. Yeah. It was just that it, it, I just felt it. I was like, okay, because I respect him as a filmmaker tremendously, and that he's tackling this thing is remarkable. Now, well, it, it, I mean, it, to that point, I mean, one of the things that made this whole thing meaningful and and actually gave it a sort of shape is that as much as this is a film about characters discovering their legacy as ghostbusters it's it's also a film about a director who is tackling his legacy as a filmmaker and that that because that works on multiple levels it felt like there was always a way in like we always understood that this was a film that had had something to say it was about the weight of familial responsibility and what, whether you choose to turn around and face it or try to chart your own path or, or you know, run away from it, basically. So, and, so we, we, we sort of knew that that was in the background. And I, and I heard uh, Jason came up right prior to the screening on a little pre, pre-recorded video and he's like, this is the most personal film I've ever made. And I understand why, because you're right, the characters are mirrors, like the director and the, and the, and the characters in the movie are mirrors. They're both struck, they're both dealing with legacy mm-hmm. and, and, and approaching it. And should you do it? And I, I have to imagine you, you and Jason must have had conversations just like, should I go down this road? Because I mean, you know, the, the amount of, I mean, look, fans are fans and haterades, haterade, and, you know, all that's going to come out. But at a certain point, it's like, I mean, do I want to, do I want to step foot in this hollowed, like, this is hollowed for, you talk about hollowed ground. (laughs) Ghostbusters is, yeah. uh, Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's so loaded, but also I think that we approached it without an expectation that this was something that had to get made. We, Mm. we started talking about it as friends uh, and collaborators. And Jason had had these couple of images that had sort of been haunting him, right? A, a girl discovering a proton pack, uh, a, a teenager who finds what was the Ecto-1, but now sort of a rusted overheap. Um, and, uh, and all of that was kind of swirling in his head while he was thinking about the loss of Harold Ramis and oh, how you really, you really can't... Uh, you can't have a Ghostbusters story or at least continue the story of the original Ghostbusters without Harold Ramis. And of course. So there was this, so, so, so there was just this <laughs> idea that, that started to come together about a way to thread that concept with the images that I was just explaining. And when Jason and I started talking about it, we never said, let's, let's uh, make sure this happens because we've got to make a Ghostbusters film or because Jason has to direct one. It was like, there is actual genuine enthusiasm because we started to feel like a, a, a an honest, a true way to make a, a sequel to Ghostbusters was beginning to form in our, in our eyes. And that we, we started to work this out without a studio, without any interference, just, the two just of make us it. As, as friends. And then we realized that it just kept coming together. And before we knew it, we had a story and we brought that story to Ivan and pitched it to him. And that, that was obviously um, a really important moment in the life of this film. And then we brought it to some of the other Ghostbusters and we brought it to uh, Sony and they were just so supportive and so uh, understanding of what this could be. Uh, and it really felt like, okay, this has a chance to be a, a true continuum. It's not something that was handed to us as an assignment, like find a way to make a new Ghostbusters film. It was done in about as pure of a way as, as could, could be imagined. I mean, you were basically writing it as almost like fan art. Like, exactly. I mean, we, we, we really, <laughs> we really were. I mean, the only complication is that, uh, you know, Jason was, had a front row seat to the entire building of the, of the empire. Right. But, um, it, it really was done with absolute sort of remove from the expectations of the, uh, of, of the business or the fans. It was done as two lovers of Ghostbusters who were seeing, if we could build a story that would live up to 
to to this world. And from what I understand from Jason's video intro uh, to the screening, uh, Papa Reitman, uh, Mr. Ivan Reitman, was on set every day with his director's chair right next to Jason. So what was it like, you know, having that presence over over you? This it's like it's having Toby Hooper on the set of Poltergeist every day sitting next I mean, to you. <laughs> I, I think, the, the, you know, the way Jason describes it is like, could you imagine if your dad was sitting next to you at work every day? Like, <laughs> and questioning everything you do. <laughs> yeah. Are you going to, you're going to push that button? Okay. I mean, that's fine. That's I mean, I wouldn't, way to do it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fine. There's lots, I guess there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, you know? And so you, you just have to put yourself in the, in the position of Jason to have made a film that works as well as it does. That's amazing. Um, but, 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 but the truth is, yeah. and I've seen this, um, now countless times on this process that Ivan is extraordinarily proud of his son and has so much um, so much love uh, both for his son as a as a human but also for his son as a filmmaker as a storyteller and just had the, like incredible respect they, they, they have a lot of mutual respect those two and uh, being close to them over these years has just given me a lot of um, appreciation for the relationship that they have. Now, um, let's talk a little bit real quickly about A Boy Called Christmas. How mm. did you come up with that idea? How the hell did you get it made in this, it, it, with, a, with a budget uh, in today's insane world? Um, so I can't wait for you to see it. Uh, it's, uh, it'll, it'll be out in the, in the States on Netflix the day before Thanksgiving, so really mm -hmm. soon, like next mm -hmm. next Wednesday. Um, it's based on a novel by Matt Haig, who uh, this year I think is the number one selling author in the world for his novel Midnight Library, which has been changing lives all over the world. Um, and he wrote this book with a really simple question. His son asked him one night um, before Christmas, what was Santa Claus like when he was my age? And the question oh. just kicked off a bedtime story that very quickly became a novel. And, uh, and the book is so full of life. It feels, it felt to me when I read it, like this was the obvious next step in the storytelling mode of Roald Dahl. You know, like this is the, a way to approach a young character's adventure where you're not holding back from all the horrible things that kids have to go through. It's got monsters. Mm -hmm. It's got real magic. It's got incredible scope because I went to uh, Lapland to start filming this film. So I, I went wow. up to the Arctic Circle. Um, then we went up uh, to – You, went, uh, well, you filmed up at the Arctic Circle? Yeah, we filmed in the Arctic Circle. It was the coldest, man. I have never been so cold in my life. I got off the plane and I felt my breath freezing in my mouth. It was the craziest feeling. And I survived barely by having Bluetooth-controlled electric socks that I was able to like – Bluetooth? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, um, I probably shouldn't be saying that even out loud because I realize it's embarrassing. As no, oh, no, listen, when it, listen, I've been cold. I understand what that means. Whatever it takes to stay warm. I don't care if it's Bluetooth. I don't care if it's a fire log yeah. in your socks. Whatever, man. <laughs> you do it. the gear. But, yeah. uh, but we, we had a scene, one of the first scenes of drama in this film. We had taken all the camera equipment up to a frozen lake at the top of the high Tatras Mountains in Slovakia using snowmobiles it was the only way we could get the equipment up there and then filmed on a frozen lake using a mobile camera rig that the uh grips invented for this film because we shot 70 millimeter and they built oh. a camera rig using basically a series <laughs> of metal poles with a gyro controlled head uh slung from them just so that we can have really smooth precise camera moving camera work on a frozen lake in the mountains while a snowstorm was coming down. And that was the first proper scene that we shot with all the actors. Um, it was an incredible adventure. I'm very proud of the film. It filmed like all over Europe. We ended up filming in London and the Czech Republic and Prague, where a lot of the sets were built in Slovakia and in Finland, as I mentioned. Um, and it was a labor of love. Like uh, it, that, that movie, and the cast is 
the cast is insane. Maggie Smith, Toby Jones, Sally Hawkins, Kristen Wiig, yeah. Kristen Wiig, Stephen Merchant. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm psyched for you to see it. I, I, think I it's, can't um, wait to see it. Ho- hopefully, as a as somebody who who dug City of Ember, I think I think this one's going to be right up your alley. Yeah, it's 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 remarkable that you were able to get this made, man. And in the it's 70 mil, and it's like you, that's. You're a unicorn, essentially, with film like this. I mean, <laughs> I mean, seriously, like you know, you know how it works in the business, man. They, they, yeah. they don't, they yeah. don't make movies like this, let alone seventy mil, let alone I'm gonna fly. Like that's a James Bond movie. Like that's that's it. Like you know, and I know you didn't have James yeah. Bond money. Uh, nope. <laughs> you no, know, no, it's all it's all on the screen, and then some. I mean, basically, <laughs> you know, uh, you'll 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 see that we really got um, we got a lot of story up there, and. Um, can't wait it's, to see it. uh, it's cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm psyched for you to see it. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Now I'm going to ask you three questions. I ask all of my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Uh, to tell stories in whatever way you can, and that doesn't always mean film or script. It can be a tiny picture book. It could be a Christmas card. It could be a craftily worded letter. But I think that actually storytelling is the exercise that makes you a filmmaker, not uh, directing or camera work or the technical aspects to the job, but the pure act of, of storytelling. So I would just say nothing can stop you. Keep telling stories. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Uh, I think saying no is a is a really powerful <laughs> tool that yeah. somebody who grew up like me, you know, in a in a in a part of the city uh, with no real access or opportunity. Um, the idea that at some point you need to be able to say no to things because you have only so many films or so many stories or so many years or days in your life that you get to do. And, uh, it's not a natural one, but I think it's, it's an important one because if you say no to something, then what it immediately asks or suggests to you is that you have to have the thing that you say yes to. Uh, and, 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 and I've found now in, in my recent experience that when you say no, somehow a light shines on the thing that you should be doing um, that's at true. the same time. And uh, so that's, that's something I've learned. Great, great piece of advice. Three of your favorite films of all time. Um, so Clockwork Orange, because I remember the, and it's not because of all the um, Kubrick memorabilia. Around you, but um, <laughs> but it's, it's because it was a moment of pure, um, pure cinema for me. I just how, remember. Yeah. How in the God's green earth, did he get that made in the seventies? That movie couldn't get made today. The first twenty minutes, just the first twenty minutes of that film. How yeah. could that even get made? It's 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 ah, uh, it's a masterwork. It's, it's a miracle. Um, all right, I'm gonna get pretentious with the next one, but it's, sure. Uh, but it's because I it's because I mean it because it was a movie that actually changed my life when I was young. I, my dad took me to see this film when I was way too young. It was. Um, uh, it was the Tin Drum. I don't know if you've seen I, it. I, a German film. I remember it's incredible it. and so messed yeah. up, but <laughs> totally changed my life. So okay. there you go. And another film that I'm going to bring up because it changed my life, because I remember that when it ended, I thought to myself, somebody made that film. This is this. There's a there's a person. There's a madman behind this story, and I want to be that person one day. And that film was Time Pen. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, no, yeah. And and yeah. when it when it ended, I just remember feeling like a rush that this was a story that 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 was made by people, and um, and how lucky they were, and I would do anything in my powers to, to get to be in 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 that chair one day. Terry Gilliam, I mean, one of the most under, I feel, I feel one of the most underappreciated filmmakers of his generation. It's just, he's so, so, I remember seeing Time Bandits in the theater yeah, at, when I was so a kid good. and it just blew, it blew my head wide open. I was like, how is this even, I, but even then I still didn't believe, I didn't even think it was like being a filmmaker was not even a conception in, in the mid eighties. Really? It just really was so, no, no, it just, no, it was, it was, it was so another world. 
yeah, it was a closed, it was a closed world. I mean, it wasn't something, again, I, I every time I step on a set, I still get that rush. They're like, that I'm I can't believe I'm doing this. In. Yeah. yeah. I, they're letting me do this. Um, but, uh, yeah, totally agree. I got to meet Terry Gilliam right oh before, I uh, right before I filmed, uh, City of Ember. We, um, we had dinner together. In oh my God. So cool. He was amazing. He weirdly, you know, grew up in Reseda just like me. So we had a lot of, <laughs> We had a lot of stuff to talk about, um, but it it's was cool. And last question, three screenplays that you think every screenwriter should read. Well, I, I've recently read the – I mean it's so, it, it's so obvious, but I recently read the screenplay to Chinatown. And I thought I would just be reading it for a couple of pages because I had, I had found it somewhere. And I started reading it and I was like, holy shit, this is so good. And I, I just could not – <laughs> but not um, three screenplays. Um, if you haven't read a Sorkin screenplay on the page, I really recommend it because the way that the words Flow. form and yeah. like, you know, uh, the, um, uh, the social network screenplay is oh. so, so good. So, so great on the page. Um, and, um, and I guess in a, in a slightly different way, um, I, I feel like reading a Diablo Cody script is like a total, uh, bit of joy for the brain. Like I've, I've had the good fortune of reading a couple of her screenplays on paper and she just has such an amazing way with words and character. And obviously my, my friend Jason Reitman has been lucky enough to bring a few of them to life on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, those are the ones that sort of come to mind right <laughs> off the bat. I'm sure I'll think of 20 more. Um, <laughs> but uh, Gil, man, thank you so much for coming on the show, bro. It has been an absolute uh, honor and pl a pleasure talking to a fellow film geek uh, about uh, geeking out about Ghostbusters and all the other stuff that uh, we discussed. So thank you again. for And again, thank you for – and tell Jason thank you for making Ghostbusters Afterlife because it is – I can now I can sleep at night now uh, because I it, it was it was rough for me since eighty nine I just it just like when is this going to happen I can sleep now so thank you my friend hearing that you can sleep means that I can finally sleep and I'll call Jason up he'll appreciate it too um, thank you uh, and uh, this has been a real blast thank you for taking the time to really talk through the uh, the films that that I've been lucky enough to be a part of. I want to thank Gil so, so much for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the tribe. Thank you again so much, Gil, not for only coming on the show, but for helping bring Ghostbusters to a new generation. As many of you heard in the interview, I am a huge, huge Ghostbusters fan. And if you have not seen me dressed as a fifth grader in my ghetto <laughs> Ghostbusters outfit that my mom made for me, uh, you definitely got to check that out. I'm, I might, I don't know if I'll put it in the show notes, but it will definitely be on our Facebook feed. So thank you again so much for listening, guys. Oh, and by the way, we will be having our yearly Black Friday blowout sale at IFH Academy, which we will be giving 30% off every single course in the IFH Academy library. So if you want to learn about distribution, if you want to learn about producing from a, a seasoned veteran producer, do you want to learn how to develop your characters uh, more emotionally from James Hart, the writer of Hook and Dracula, if you want to learn how to finance your movie, if you want to learn how to attach uh, movie stars to your script or project, all of these courses and webinars are available at screenwritingpodcast.com. And all you need to do is use the coupon code BLACK. Friday 2021. That's Black Friday 2021. And that will be the code for the deal. So definitely check that out. It will be going on until the end of the month. But after that, it is gone. So act now. Thank you again so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv.